Hi, and welcome to this installment of Bergeron Briefs. My name is uh, Arthur Bergeron. If you haven't seen the show before, uh, I am an attorney. I'm an elder law attorney. I work at a firm called Myrick O'Connell. There are 60 of us. Uh, I, we're in central Massachusetts. I do nothing but elder law. Usually, in this show, I am talking to somebody. There's somebody over here, or there's somebody over there, and I'm asking them questions because I've tried to use this show as a way of introducing you to people whom, and programs that you need to know about if you're a senior. Today, though, I want to talk about something that you absolutely have to know about, um, and you need to know about it now because you may be needing to plan for it or deal with it now, and that is uh, the governor's budget. Now, that's a big topic, but there is a particular piece of the governor's budget that you should be aware of. Um, every, every governor's budget every year um, gets proposed, and most of the sections of the budget have requests for amounts of money of various kinds. But then, as part of the governor's budget, there are always so-called outside sections. These are sections um, which typically, um, if passed, constitute a change in the law, a change in the actual Massachusetts law. But they are changes in the law that have a fiscal impact. They are changes as a result of which either the Commonwealth may be bringing in more revenue or maybe spending less because of changes in benefit programs, et cetera. So in, in Governor Baker's budget this year, which was proposed very uh, recently, uh, and which will be acted upon probably by July, there is one outside section of which you should be aware, and that is outside section 11. Um, what outside section 11 seeks, seeks to do, among other things, is to significantly expand the amount of money that MassHealth is able to recoup um, uh, from people or from the estates uh, or assets of people who have qualified for MassHealth benefits. Uh, for those of you who have followed this show or been concerned about these issues, you know that MassHealth is the Massachusetts name for the Medicaid program. To understand the significance of these changes, you need to know a little bit of background about Medicaid and about the programs that they pay for right now. So, Medicaid uh, was actually created the same year as the Medicare program back in 1965. Uh, the purpose of both of these programs, or specifically the purpose of the Medicare program, was to help uninsured older people. Um, why? Well, it's easy to figure that out by knowing one important statistic. In 1960, five years before Medicare was passed, over 33 percent of all residents of the country over age 65 were considered poor. Today, that is just hard to believe, that a third of the elder population in the country would be poor. The reason was very simple. Uh, even though Social Security had been in existence for, for many years, uh, older people uh, were, would typically not qualify for regular commercial medical insurance. They'd get sick and so they'd go broke because they'd have to spend up all of their resources paying for their medical problems that tend to occur more as you get older. Uh, by way of comparison, in the most recent statistics that I've seen, uh, the census numbers, only about 7% of all American citizens or of all American citizens over the age of 65 are poor. That's just an unbelievable change which many people attribute to the existence of the Medicare program. You no longer go broke if you get sick unless you have Alzheimer's uh, or other diseases that cause dementia. There is a certain irony to that because the, the, the treatment resulting from Alzheimer's disease is of course much less invasive than what you would get if you have cancer. If you have cancer and you need chemotherapy or you need operations or you need any of these things, well, all of that care is going to get paid for by Medicare. If you have um, uh, diabetes and you, you're dealing with amputations or diet or any of the many, many side effects of diabetes or lung cancer, um, all of those medical treatments are going to get paid for by Medicare. If you have Alzheimer's, though, uh, and you're suffering from the major symptom of Alzheimer's, which is that you've got dementia, then what you really need is not all this fancy treatment, but someone to maybe help you with eating or with showering or dressing in the morning, or someone to be there 
just to make sure that you don't inadvertently hurt yourself or drift away because of your difficulties with memory. Unfortunately, none of those services is covered by Medicare. That is the reason why so many of the clients that I deal with every day are people who are either worried about Alzheimer's or they have Alzheimer's or they have a loved one who has Alzheimer's. And by the way, I'm using Alzheimer's as kind of a shorthand for all of the diseases that cause these kinds of dementia symptoms. Um, the reason why, although Parkinson's and many other diseases may have this as a side effect, statistically it appears that about 70% of those people who have dementia have it because they have Alzheimer's disease. So getting back, the reason why so much of this planning is done is because people realize that if they get Alzheimer's or their spouse done and they haven't done any planning, they may very well go broke. Um, and which is why they do the planning. So to understand um, what this, the, this expanded estate recovery is all about and outside section 11, you need to know what the current rules, the mass health rules are right now. So if you were a single person uh, and you uh, had uh, Alzheimer's disease and your dementia had gotten so severe that you needed to be uh, in a skilled nursing facility, uh, then you would need to be paying for that facility on a private on a private pay basis and the typical cost runs between three and four hundred dollars a day unless you qualify for mass health to qualify for mass health skilled nursing or long-term care benefits you need to show that you have less than two thousand dollars in countable assets you can own a home but if you own a home mass health will put a lien on that home and following your death mass health will have a claim against your home to get repaid for all of the money that mass health had paid during your lifetime to for your assistance so folks often will come to me who are single because their spouse died or because they're divorced and say well so is there anything i can do to protect my house because i'd really like my house to go to my kids and many of these people have you know that's their biggest asset and they did they've owned it often mortgage free because they saved up and paid off the mortgage uh, they don't want to lose control of their cash but they would like to end up assuring that their kids get the house so if that's the situation the most common advice that i give to people is well you know you can save the house by transferring a so-called remainder interest in the house, that is the interest in the house that starts when you die, to your children uh, or to a trust for their benefit right now. But keep, I always suggest to these people, keep a life estate in the house. What is a life estate? A life estate uh, legally is total control of the house, the, the, the right to live there, the right to earn rents from the property, together with total responsibility for the house, the responsibility to pay for the insurance, the taxes, etc. Um, and so uh, the, the el elders often will keep a so-called life estate in the house and transfer this remainder interest to their children uh, or to a trust for the benefit of their children. So if that elder right now uh, qualified for Mass Health, if they qualified for Mass Health today, uh, if they were at Windermere and, and needed to qualify and qualify today, they could qualify for that house even though they just owned a life estate in the house as long as that remainder interest had been transferred at least five years ago. Um, MassHealth would put a lien on that life estate, but following the elder's death, that lien would evaporate because the life estate would evaporate. And therefore, the children would um, be able to use the house or sell the house without that lien. So one of the section of the parts of outside section 11 of Governor's Baker's budget would change that by saying that if you own any interest in any asset whether it is a life estate or a joint tenancy uh, or any other kind of interest that would survive following your death even if that asset was not going to go through your probate estate mass health will have a claim against that asset equal to the value of that asset the moment before you died. So in the case of a life estate for a person who is in their 80s, that may very well be, be equal to about 20% of the value of the asset, right? So if, if the governor's budget, if outside section 11 in its current form passes, there will be a claim on that life estate as to anyone who qualifies for mass health after a particular day. The day that is specified in the budget is a day in July uh, of this year. 
that date could change. Uh, but the point is that for all of those people, and there are a lot of them who have done this kind of planning already, that means that that portion of the value of their home is going to be exposed to estate recovery following their death. So you need to be aware of this because you, you may need to be changing your planning to deal with this issue. That's the first section. The second really important section deals with, with another change to an aspect of estate recovery. The way that estate recovery now works, if you are in a nursing home and you die, uh, but your spouse is still alive, is that any of the asset that while Mass Health would have a claim against your assets as a result of your death, Mass Health would have no claim against your spouse for any of your spouse's assets. And that's really important because pretty much a standard part of uh, asset protection planning when one spouse goes into the nursing home, uh, as I'll tell folks, just transfer the assets to the other spouse. And, and if you're transferring your home to the other spouse, and that home has an equity of less than $828,000, um, the other spouse can own that asset while still having you qualify for MassHealth long-term care benefits. And then if you die, while MassHealth would have a claim against your assets, they would have no claim against that house. Well, under another part of outside section 11, that is going to change too. MassHealth will continue to have a claim against the probate assets, the probate assets from the estate of the surviving spouse. Even if that surviving spouse dies, the day after the person in the nursing home, or the week after, or the year after, or 10 years after. Even if that person moves out of state, even if that person remarries, upon that person's death, Mass Health will have a claim that could have originated years or decades before against that surviving spouse's probate estate. That is a huge, huge change um, from what has ever happened before here. So, um, that's a lot of information, and I'm sorry if I couldn't make it simpler, uh, but this is a complicated process. So I have a couple of pieces of advice for you. First of all, you should talk to your attorney. If you have done any planning uh, anticipating the, the possibility that you may need MassHealth in the future, you want to at least talk to your attorney about whether any of that planning uh, needs to change. Second, you need to be following this issue. Um, many bills are, are uh, proposed in the legislature every year, thousands of bills actually. Only a few hundred pass in any particular year. Most bills, when they go to the legislature, will go to a committee for study. Uh, and if the committee cannot make a decision regarding the bill that's in front of them, or if there is opposition to the bill, or they feel that there are the, the reasons for passing the bill may be, may, may be balanced against other reasons for not passing it, they, may, they will typically send the bill to a study committee or keep the matter in their committee so as to assure that before any legislation gets passed, all different viewpoints are considered. That is not what happens to budgets, though. The budget is the one and only bill that gets proposed in the legislature, typically in January, as this one was, with the guarantee that it will get passed in some form fairly quickly. Typically, uh, on or about or on or before June 30th, and the reason for that is uh, Massachusetts, like a lot of, uh, of uh, states and, the, and, and companies, runs on a fiscal year that starts July 1. If the budget isn't passed by June 30th, there's no money to pay anybody starting July 1. So there is a real imperative to get a budget passed. For that reason, outside Section 11 will be dealt with one way or the other within the next several months. It may get passed as is, in which case everything I just explained to you um, will come into effect and you're going to need to deal with it. Uh, or it may get amended so that one or more pieces of outside Section 11 may get changed or it could get deleted. Outside Section 11 could simply get deleted. Those decisions as to whether that is going to happen, any of those things are going to happen, is totally in the hands right now of your state representative and your state senator and the people they work with. Um, the final form of this bill will be the result of the vote of 160 representatives and 40 senators. So if you are interested in this issue 
and want to make sure you're following it or have an opinion regarding this bill, then you probably want to talk to your state representative and your state senator about it. Um, the reason why that, to give you the reason why that's so important, I'm going to give you, go back in history one more time. Um, something very similar to outside Section 11 actually passed the Massachusetts legislature and got signed into law in, if I recall, 2003. It happened, if I recall, the very same way. It was an outside section to a budget, so no one was really paying attention to it very much. And then all of a sudden people woke up and MassHealth had all of this brand new estate recovery authority, which MassHealth immediately started implementing so that they could try to collect the money that they said they were going to collect when they got the outside section passed as part of the budget. Those collection efforts caused an absolute uproar all around the Commonwealth. People were saying, what is this? They called their state reps, they called their state senators, um, they called the governor's office, they found out that it was a law. And since it was a law, it could not be changed except by another act of the legislature. There was so much pressure at that time to get this law reversed that the, ho the House and the Senate both passed a uh, new law basically invalidating the old law, overturning the old law. However, by that time, a new governor had been elected. It was Governor Romney. Governor Romney thought this bill was just, was the, the, that the, uh, the expanded estate recovery was just terrific. And so he vetoed the law. He vetoed the overturning of the old law. The legislature, once again, had to get back together and then had to muster up enough votes, two-thirds in each house of the legislature, to override the governor's veto. There was such an uproar in the public that that happened and the bill actually got overturned and we were back to the old estate recovery rules, if I recall, by back in late 2004. The point of this, though, is the overturning of the bill once it was in place caused a lot of angst and aggravation. And in the meantime, during the period of time when the bill was in place, there were a whole bunch of people who had to deal with the reality of the bill. Um, Hopefully, if enough people are aware of this bill this time, that won't happen and the bill will end up being framed or shaped in a way that is really appropriate for taking care of those people who purely through the luck of the draw ended up getting sick with a disease that Medicare doesn't cover. And it's totally luck of the draw, right? If you happen to get cancer or, have, or, or any other disease other than one that causes dementia, Medicare is going to take care of you. You're not going to go bankrupt, and the money that you save and want to leave to your children, you're going to be able to do. Um, regarding that cluster of diseases, however, the, the cluster that is Alzheimer's and other diseases that cause dementia, the only thing, way that you can protect any of these assets is through all of the asset restructuring and through a law which the governor is now proposing to change. So you need to be staying on top of this if it's going to affect you. Um, and you need to be uh, talking to anybody that you want to talk to if you think that this bill is inappropriate. So, thank you very much for watching. I really appreciate your taking the time. I promise next time there really will be a guest and I'll only be answering questions. Uh, and I look forward to seeing you in the next installment of Bergeron Briefs. Thank you very much.